Okay, last in this session is the president of the International Society of Endovascular Specialists, it's Dr. Crazier, and he's gonna talk to us about laser fenestration for endografts. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm not sure this is going to be of uh, interest to uh, most of you. There are a few international uh, uh, internationalists present here and that might be of interest uh, to you, but um, uh, I hope I don't bore you with that. Uh, <clears throat> Here are my disclosures, nothing really pertinent to this, but um, as Alan knows and uh, Dr. Serino here, uh, <clears throat> type 2 endoleak is uh, not a rare occurrence. And it has been highly popularized that this is no big deal, it's just a little nuisance, uh, forget about it because they don't do harm and don't worry about it. But uh, like for uh, Dr. Lumsden and myself, uh, uh, we have performed thousands of those procedures and if the incidence is somewhere between 10 to 35%, we're talking about a large number of patients that need surveillance because uh, this might be minor problem to you, but it could be a major problem to uh, uh, your relative or your mother or your father or whatever. So take that into consideration. Another uh, frustrating thing is that there is a delayed presentation of type 2 endoleak that occurs between 27 to uh, 32 percent uh, of patients. Now, I didn't mention to you what type 2 endoleak is, and I apologize for that. Uh, a leak is a strange thing. It could be uh, uh, interpreted in a neurological uh, fashion, but uh, the way this terminology was described, flow into the aneurysm from one way or the other, either around the stain graft or um, through the stain graft or through the collateral branches. Now, when we are talking abdominal aortic aneurysm and endovascular repair of the aneurysm, and we, we talk about type two endoleak, it means that it's coming from the branches that normally exist or are newly formed. Typically, there are lumbar arteries. There is four pair of lumbar arteries. There is a superior mesenteric and there is inferior mesenteric. There are communications with all those branches. So it's not uncommon that you might have those communications that will persist for a long time or forever. Now, uh, when the surgery is done for abdominal aortic aneurysm repair, the surgeon has direct vision to those arteries, and it has the option, and typically what is done is you ligate the lumbar arteries so you don't have that backflow. Now, we as an interventionalist, uh, whether you're a surgeon or a cardiologist or radiologist, you don't have that luxury to uh, be able to see those. They might not be visible, or they might be visible, but you hope they will disappear over a period of time. So this is the frustrating part of it, that we are doing the procedure knowing that there is a potential problem. Now, uh, the first stain graph was performed uh, decades ago, and there have been significant improvements as far as uh, technology, uh, equipment, materials, and so on is concerned. But as far as type 2 endoleak is concerned, nothing has been resolved uh, in a really convincing manner until uh, the present time. Now, uh, we will all agree that if there is a type 2 endoleak or flow to the aneurysm, and the aneurysm is enlarging, uh, we need to fix it, okay? Now, there are several other scenarios that you can encounter. Uh, Alan, and you probably deal with this particular instance. You have a seven or 10 centimeter abdominal aneurysm, and you have a persistent endoleak without enlargement, and this patient lives in uh, Scotland, and he might come here once in a long while or never again. Are you going to leave that type to endoleak there without considering uh, in taking care of this particular problem? What about a large endoleak without an enlargement? Okay, uh, what are you gonna do about those type of things? Are they also causing potential danger? So there are a variety of scenarios how this has been treated in the past or even in the present time. One of the simplest ways is to approach it through the transradial approach. Let's say going from the superior mesenteric to the inferior mesenteric into the sac and coil embolizing. This has been done from the very beginning or going through the iliolumbars, internal iliac arteries or translumbar puncture. Now, this has been popularized more recently uh, because you can get directly to the leak area and coil embolize it or put onyx or some other kind of glue and resolve the problem. And this has been done quite frequently and relatively successfully so. 
But the typical scenario will be that the radiologist typically will do that on the CT guidance in the CT room, and then the patient has to be transferred to an interventional suite, and then you complete the procedure there. In most of my instances where I have participated and seen this, this could last up to five hours or so when you take into concern the logistics. And uh, also, it, it is a cumbersome procedure, per se. Now, you could do a preemptive embolization at the time of the procedure, but again, uh, since a large number of those endoleaks disappear by themselves, it's an overly aggressive procedure, and it might not be needed in a great majority of patients, and it potentially could uh, carry certain complications and risk, plus it prolongs the time of the procedure. Transcable has been done as well, and I would like to concentrate and talk to you a little bit more about what we have been embracing for the last couple of years, laser-assisted transgraft embolization. Now, there's nothing magic about laser. We know a lot of things about laser, uh, but, uh, and has been used in many different uh, applications, but we find this to be the easiest way to get through it. Now, Alan has shown using one of the puncture needles that we use during international procedure. That is certainly another way to do it, uh, but it might be a little bit more challenging and cumbersome to penetrate through the graft to be able to address this. Now, as I mentioned, transarterial uh, embolization, like in this particular patient with um, annular stent graft that was so dear to Rod White for many decades, um, this uh, stent graft has failed us in so many ways, but like any other stent graft, um, it has nothing to do with type uh, 2 endoleak, and as you can see, this patient had a type 2 endoleak from the inferior mesenteric. We coil embolized that, then a few years after that, she had iliolumbar communications, and interestingly enough, this lady had five different uh, interventions for type 2 endoleak without resolving this problem. So this is like a never-ending problem in certain scenarios, particularly on patients that are on anticoagulants for one reason or the other, but also for many other reasons. So uh, the bottom line is if you're going to, we all agree on that, if you're going to successfully treat type 2 endoleak, you have to approach it like you would approach a AV malformation. You have to go to the nidus, and you have to occlude the nidus. Not only that you have to resolve the issue of inflow and outflow, but the nidus has to be uh, excluded. And there are a variety of things that you can do it with coils, a variety of glues. Onyx has been very popular for, for the last decade or so. This originated in uh, uh, intracranial interventions. Uh, the great thing about Onyx is that it solidifies relatively fast. It has a tantalum powder in it. You can see it very easily. And uh, this way you can resolve the problem in a very effective way. There are some disadvantages of it. Number one, it's very expensive. It's, we call it black gold. I think the vial costs more than $3,000. And typically, typically you use at least two to three vials per case. So um, uh, now this can be done translumbar or anterior approach. As you see here, this is translumbar. You inject uh, onyx. Uh, there are different uh, consistencies, 18 and 32, that is more viscous. And uh, you resolve the problem, perform the angiogram, and if you don't see endoleak, you are done. This is the anterior approach. Uh, again, this cannot be used in a lot of scenarios because there's gut in front of it in a lot of instances, but in this particular patient, it worked well. So obviously there are scenarios where you cannot do that uh, for a variety of reasons, typically anatomy. Uh, this is a transcable approach, again, in very few and selective patients because actually the endoleak might not be close to the inferior vena cava, might be more anteriorly positioned or on the other side. So that is certainly an issue. Like in this particular uh, case here, you see, you would have to go through the bone in a lot of scenarios, and it's located in a kind of awkward position, and the aneurysm is enlarging. So um, uh, one of the interventional uh, radiologists in uh, Milwaukee, a good friend of mine, Mark Mewson, has started this approach uh, roughly four years ago uh, using a laser to uh, penetrate through any of the stent grafts that we commercially have available at the present time. And he has shown that it's a very simple, straightforward, and fast uh, approach to treat uh, endoleaks. And I'm going to go through some of the steps here. Of course, I 
I skipped a lot of things that were already discussed, uh, fusion imaging, uh, integration of different imaging uh, modalities, uh, core registration, and all of those terms that we have to use now on a regular basis. So the bottom line is you go from the femoral approach, right or left, depending on the scenario, you get to one of the limbs or the main body, and uh, typically we like to use a catheter that's easily uh, visible. Not all catheters are easily visible. And uh, place it coaxially, uh, snugly to that particular stent graft, and we use a 0.9 millimeter laser probe. And uh, when we use one of the 0.014 wires and uh, activate the laser, um, uh, and uh, uh, it goes through it like through butter. Now, of course, what you have to be absolutely sure, that's where merging images and fusion comes into importance. You have to have a CAT scan before because you might not see that uh, leak on the angiogram and you know exactly where you're going and you're pointing to a millimeter where you have to be and it takes uh, probably a tenth of a second, just go through the graft and then you advance your glide wire, 0.014 wire, and then you advance a catheter. We typically use a echelon catheter, which is low profile catheter. We advance it in the cavity, as you can see over there. And uh, we typically use onyx, fill it up completely. And then uh, we gradually pull the catheter all the way to the entry. And uh, there typically there is no leak. Uh, Dr. Mewison in the first few cases was concerned there might be a leak through that little perforation of 0.9 millimeters and he put a little uh, iliac uh, extension there, but then he found really that there was no need for it. So we don't do that at all. Now, uh, uh, here is one of our cases um, uh, and you can see how rapidly the aneurysm can decrease in size. Uh, here is another case um, and uh, pre and post as you can see with very, very good results and a very quick and easy approach to resolve uh, this problem. Now we have used this not only in type two endoleaks but also in type one endoleaks because you can fill this cavity with the onyx and sometimes it's almost impossible to come from above uh, and go around the uh, stent graft to fill that uh, cavity with onyx or, or coils. And that also is a very effective way. And we have done it also with thoracic stent grafting where sometimes it's very difficult to do it in, in any other way. So this is typically in all of our patients, an outpatient procedure typically takes about a, an hour to an hour and a half, and uh, typically it's very successful. In early stages, we use coils, and the reason that we use coils in addition to onyx, onyx because onyx is so expensive, and coils were less expensive, but I think that it's better just to do onyx and finish the procedure quick, and you don't have to waste time with placing coils. So uh, what is Dr. Mewison's um, experience with it, and uh, we are, uh, this manuscript is actually uh, in press at the present time in Journal of Vascular Surgery. We partner with him uh, <clears throat> in it, uh, but this is his experience. Uh, he uh, attempted this procedure in 33 patients. He was successful in 32 patients to go through it. Uh, the stent graft, the technical success was 98% to be able to get to that point, to that nidus, and then he has a follow-up in the 20, uh, one uh, patient at, at one year. I think you need minimum six months of follow-up to make sure that you were successful. And his success rate is 86% where the aneurysm has decreased in size or stable. This is a significantly better than it, with any other approaches because typically the success rate with any other approach in literature has been reported to be no higher than 50%. We have uh, 12 patients that we have performed this procedure on. For the last uh, few years, uh, we had 100% success rate in being able to enter into that nidus, and no complications. As I mentioned, all of them are done on an outpatient basis. We have a shorter follow-up than Dr. Mewison. We had to repeat it in two where new endoleaks appear, which is frustrating, and they could appear for whatever reason, but typically it's anticoagulants, and I've seen it also in patients with malignancies. They, uh, with tissue necrotic factors somehow get this DIC within the graft, uh, within the cavity where they lyse thrombose, lyse thrombose, and so on. And 83% of patients so far have decreased the aneurysm size or are stable. 
So um, in conclusion, I think uh, we will all agree in certain subset of patients, uh, type 2 endoleak for us is the most frustrating thing because it's cumbersome to fix it and we cannot anticipate when it will appear and requires close surveillance and uh, expertise to fix it. Now, uh, our approach with laser-assisted uh, uh, approach using Onyx, uh, so far it has been relatively easy and a very effective way to address and resolve the problem. It reduces the time and complexity of the procedure and uh, it has definitely improved our procedural and uh, in Dr. Mewison's experience, midterm results for treatment of uh, type 2 endoleak. However, uh, a longer uh, follow-up obviously is needed, particularly in our experience, in a significantly larger number of patients to see if this approach is definitely superior to currently uh, commonly used techniques for treatment of type 2 endoleak. Thank you very much. So, in talking about imaging, you know, because one of the challenges with these is you pack a bunch of calls in or you put Onyx in there and you come back and the follow-up imaging can be a bit of a challenge in trying to figure out whether there is an ongoing type 2 endoleak. Is there anything that we could be doing in terms of the image acquisition to help us differentiate dye from Onyx on the follow-up? Can you, can you take the microphone? Yeah. To dual energy scans to differentiate coil mass from the onyx because they have different uh, attenuation. But I don't think anyone has looked into this in detail. But one other imaging that could be helpful, especially when you're injecting onyx during the procedure or at the end of the procedure, could be doing ultrasound right on the table, right after you finish your embolization, knowing whether you have, doc documenting whether you have successfully embolized the nidus, as you call it. What about you're talking about co uh, contrast, though, versus onyx, right? Rather yeah. I mean, once you start embolizing and treating these things, you're really going, subsequently going off aortic sac diameter. Yeah, Is it getting, because you can't see can't inside see the, the sac. So yeah, so a uh, couple of things on that. Uh, so obviously, you have to do a pre-contrast, during contrast, and uh, late uh, imaging with the CT. And uh, so you see in a pre-contrast just uh, onyx there, or you see coils, mm -hmm. and uh, you have that comparison there, and then you see post, and obviously if you see the area that's larger, you assume that this is contrast there as well. The second thing is what we routinely do is, you know, a lot of people just measure the maximum diameter. We routinely do a volumetric analysis, which is, in my opinion, we published uh, that on that, much more sensitive uh, means of seeing whether the aneurysm is enlarging. And we always do a duplex as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I follow those patients. But uh, as far as Onyx is concerned, it was not designed for that particular purpose. Yeah. And I think that it would be a, a great benefit to us and a need to change the amount of tantalum there. Of course, we need to see it at the time of the procedure, but it's obviously too much of tantalum that interferes with our imaging on, on follow-up. So that, that certainly is an issue and a concern. What, what, what about MR? I don't know. A short, a short, a short answer is a, I don't you know. know. Maybe a great application for that room we're putting in the cath lab yeah. in the building. You mean MR for follow-up or during the? Uh, either one. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you want to see around the onyx, you're looking for flow, right. not yeah. density. If, if you it can that. be done, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Okay. Ultra sensitive good uh, MRI, it's very helpful uh, MRI. So, so one of the things that the, we, we've not used Onyx in these endografts largely, a lot, but largely because of costs. I mean, it was brought in in the neural world to treat aneurysms that are the size of your finger, AVMs that are this size. And so we're dealing with something, you can unload a heck of a lot of Onyx into it. Um, but what, it, plus you can't get it in an institute. You're supposed to work with a neuro uh, interventionist because that's the labeling and it's supposed to be shipped through them. Um, but one of the things that they taught me was during the injections, because what happens is you start filling up the sac with onyx. So you, you stab on the floor and you get this big old black mass that's sitting in there. And what they use is road mapping. And so they inject it, 
they reacquire the road map, it subtracts out the old onyx mass, and now you see where the new onyx is actually going. It's very helpful to be able to do it that way. Yeah. Actually, not only road map, but dynamic road map, because you'll have to spin the patient. Mm -hmm. There might be nooks and crannies there where you don't see yeah. it in one view, yeah. but you have to see it in yeah. some other view. So that's very important. This is where the imaging comes into play to a great deal. All right, let's take a 50-minute break and then we'll kind of have a couple more presentations and get out of here.